If you've been active in the gaming community in the last two decades, there's a very good chance that you've heard of the Ace Attorney series. I feel like almost everybody knows about this series in some way or another, whether they're familiar with the OST, the iconic Objection! or even in seeing those bots on Twitter and Reddit that turn arguments into cases. I was one of those people until late last year when I purchased the HD trilogy on Switch and decided to actually try the games out. And oh man, I was so glad that I did. Ace Attorney 1 caught my attention more than I ever thought it would, so I just recently finished playing the second game in the series, Justice For All. And if you've played this game before, it's not going to be a shock to hear me say that this game was pretty underwhelming. I just couldn't help but feel like a lot of stuff from this game was kind of downgraded from Ace Attorney 1, from the music to the case quality, outside of one particular case. As a disclaimer, there will be some spoilers throughout the video. I'm torn because I want this video to be accessible to people who may want to play the game for themselves, but I also want to articulate why I think what I think about these cases, and sadly, I have to go into spoiler territory to do that. So I will be leaving timestamps in the description denoting where spoilers occur for each individual case. I'll keep these spoilers contained so that way you can skip past them if you want to experience the game for yourself first, but if you're interested, please stick around to discuss how the Ace Attorney series hit its sophomore slump with Justice For All. A commonality between all Ace Attorney games is that the first case of each game acts as a tutorial, generally speaking. Your client is extremely trustworthy and is easy to defend. You also don't need to do any investigating in these cases. All of the necessary evidence and profiles are given to you during the trial so that the player can learn how to cross-examine witnesses, find inconsistencies, and present evidence to make their case. And all of this is really good stuff. I like that the game gives you a safer environment to experiment and figure things out on your own to start. However, just as for All is a sequel, so how does it go about creating a situation where Phoenix may need to relearn how to lawyer again? <sighs> he gets amnesia. Why is this the best thing that they could come up with? I get that this is supposed to tie back to the main theme of the game, kind of, but it just felt super contrived to me. In the first game, it's natural because it's Phoenix's first case, and I think that they did a great job with this in Trials and Tribulations, with the first case being a memory to Mia Fey's first case years ago. Regardless, the first case of Justice For All is pretty bland. This case is like twice the length of Ace Attorney 1's tutorial case, and the claims that you make are much more far-fetched and make little sense at times. Maggie is a fine character, but I can't help but feel like this case was generally pretty boring. Case 2 is actually pretty good. I like the setting that this one has. It's one of the few times where you actually meet the victim before their demise, and I think that it's cool that this case expands the Faye family lore. This case also introduces a new prosecutor, Franziska von Karma, who's a pretty alright character. I think she's an interesting enough antagonist in this game, but the whole whip gag wore out on me super quickly. While I do find that this case's actual culprit was pretty easy to figure out, I do think that the twists are good, and the introduction of the the psyche lock mechanic is done pretty organically here. While it's not one of my favorite cases or anything, I think it was good. However, nothing could prepare me for what would happen next. Turnabout Big Top is without doubt a big flop. This case is just straight up awful, and if you've spent any amount of time in the Ace Attorney community, you know that this is pretty much the community's consensus. This case features some of the worst writing the series has ever had to endure, period. Let's start off with our client, Max. He's super arrogant, uncooperative, and unlikable. He refuses to tell you vital information for no reason other than to force you to go on pointless fetch quests. Mo the Clown is one of the key witnesses here, and trying to find any useful information in his dialogue is like trying to find a funny joke in an episode of The Big Bang Theory. There's also Ben and Trilo, who are just so grating to deal with for no reason, and I hated every second they were on screen. Not to mention, there's a weird love subplot between Max, Trilo, and another character who are all obsessed with Regina, the lion tamer and the ringmaster's daughter. Now, this is overdone and corny enough on its own, but Regina is also 16 and extremely naive, which just makes this entire subplot creepy and predatory. What is that? Which the game completely ignores. Also, as a quick side note before we get into spoilers, I feel like the Von Karma whip gag was way overused in this case, and I felt like the psyche locks were clumsily forced into it as well. 
I also hate how the twist villain is not introduced until you're well into the case, and not to mention his motive and the actual murder make no sense. You mean to tell me that Acro dropped this bust onto the wrong person, killed him, the victim's cape fell off of him and attached itself to the bust as Acro was dragging it back up, and when Mo saw the bust floating back up with the cape attached to it, that's how he assumed it was Max? That has got to be the biggest stretch I have ever heard. Not to mention that Acro murdered the the wrong person over a complete accident. This four to five hour case just has such a trash ending that makes you feel like you wasted your time. It also has random questions that will deplete your entire health bar if you get them wrong, some of the most unlikable characters in the series. This case sucks. So far, Justice For All's track record is not looking too good, but the fourth and final case is the saving grace that this game needed. The fourth case has an incredible setup, and the stakes are set incredibly high from the very beginning. Maya gets kidnapped, and to ensure her safety, you need to get the defendant, Matt Ongard, a not guilty verdict that day. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Especially since Matt seems like a pretty nice guy, has a solid alibi, and he has a pretty sketchy manager that could be a suspect pretty easily. You also present Maya's Magatama to him, and no psyche locks appear. This case involves lots of returning characters, has pretty good pacing, and has good humor when necessary. During the first trial, Adrian Andrews is looking super suspicious, albeit very distraught, and as you fight hard to get that not guilty verdict for Matt, things start to go awry. You are unable to prove that Ms. Andrews was the murderer in this trial, since you have no definitive proof. You then confront Edgeworth. Oh yeah, Edgeworth is back in this case as the prosecutor, since Maya's kidnapper decided to shoot Franziska in the shoulder as a gift. And Edgeworth reveals to you that the victim was murdered by an assassin, as denoted by a card that Ms. Andrews found at the crime scene. The player also knows that Maya found another one of these cards in the wine cellar where she's being held hostage, which leads the player to get even more worried for Maya. However, it also leads you to be even more suspicious of Matt. Why does this assassin who not only killed Juan, Matt's biggest rival, also have so much interest in Matt getting an acquittal? Edgeworth confirms this suspicion by telling Phoenix that Matt hired the assassin, which he was just now able to ascertain since he now knows that there was a shell card at the scene of the crime. You later confront Matt about this, and five Psyche Locks appear, the most that you've ever seen in the game thus far, which proves through gameplay that you've just uncovered a super dark secret. After some questioning, he essentially admits that he did hire an assassin to murder Juan. This twist is absolutely excellent, for numerous reasons. Firstly, this is the first time that Phoenix is forced to defend a client who is actually guilty of the crime that they are charged with. This changes the game significantly, as Phoenix is now no longer trying to find the real culprit and unravel lies, now he is actively trying to stall the trial and get somebody wrongfully convicted to save Maya's life. This also completely twists the psyche lock mechanic. Even though Max from the previous case may not have been likable or believable, you always knew that he was the good guy because this mystical power tells you so. And while I thought that this was kind of lame at first, this twist almost made it worth it because it uses a gameplay mechanic to subvert the player's expectations, which is really good stuff. It almost feels like this mechanic was made for this twist specifically. This also creates an incredibly interesting moral dilemma for Phoenix. Does he work to defend some someone that he knows is guilty and indict someone that he knows is innocent, all to save his friend's life? Or does he turn on his client and stick to his morals at the cost of Maya's life? All of this comes to a head at the case's climax, which isn't perfect, but it does have multiple endings and real consequences for Phoenix's actions. This second trial is incredibly tense and the stakes are super high. The writing in this last case is so good that it absolutely saves justice for all. While this case is great, it's not perfect. I do think that old bag gets a little obnoxious in this case, although I think that's the point. I also think having Shelly testify was kind of weird, especially since he was essentially admitting to murder with seemingly no consequence. And as much as I enjoyed seeing Edgeworth back, I do think that his inclusion here did kind of take the spotlight away from Franziska as a prosecutor, which is a shame because I thought Franziska had a bit more potential to be an interesting character in this game, but I sadly felt that she was a little underdeveloped and that this case might have been a great place for her character to grow a little bit more. The the final case in Justice For All is a huge jump in quality from the previous three cases. From its character development to its twists and central themes, I think that this game twists the traditional Ace Attorney formula to deliver a one-of-a-kind case, one that could only be pulled off after the formula was well established and players got comfortable with the traditional case structure. This case allowed the writers to truly create a compelling story, I just wish that the rest of the game matched this level of quality. 
Now, to be fair, Ace Attorney 1 didn't only have good cases. Case 1 is a good introductory case, but it's pretty basic. Case 2 features a kind of bland cast of characters and a pretty lame twist villain, and Case 3 kind of drags at times and has some plot holes. But none of these cases are nearly as boring or flat out bad as the cases in Justice for All. Unfortunately, it appears that Justice for All was created on a pretty tight deadline. Shu Takumi, the writer for the original Ace Attorney trilogy, was forced to write the entire game script within three and a half months before the game would be put into production, which is an absolutely insane time frame, since it took him over a month to write each case from the original game. Sadly, this is likely why most of the cases in Justice for All wound up having so many plot holes, contrived tropes, and lack of cohesion. My heart goes out to Mr. Takumi for all the stress he was put under, and I'm beyond thankful that Case 4 wound up being so good. And it seems like he was given a bit more time and creative freedom to write Trials and Tribulations. All in all, I love the Ace Attorney series. It's quickly becoming one of my favorites. Even though Justice for All underwhelmed me and I was almost ready to give up on it, I'm glad I stuck with it to be able to experience the genius that was its final case. If you haven't played the Ace Attorney games yet and you managed to make it through this video without seeing any spoilers, please go get the games for yourself. The HD trilogy is available on PC and Switch, often going on sale for $15. Pretty much the entire series is available on the 3DS eShop as well, so if you think you're going to want to play the games that came after the trilogy, the 3DS is a super convenient place to do so. There are also DS games, and I feel like everybody owns a DS, so if you don't have any of the previously mentioned consoles, you can track down physical copies and play the games that way. Overall, Justice for All suffers from severe sequelitis, but despite its shortcomings, I still walked away ready for more. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day.